Turn in your Bibles today, if you will, please, to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's good to see you. Thank you again for being in your places. Remember our services tonight. If you will, please, officers and teachers and bus workers meeting tonight, 630, and then our service here in the auditorium at 7 o'clock. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse, beginning in verse 13. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Now I want to hasten to say, and I think it needs to be said, in the society in which we're living today, people that don't know about the history of the Bible, they might think about the word sober there as being not intoxicated. That's not what the word means at all. Paul said, I'm not trying to get over a drunk. What Paul is talking about, the word sober there means to be of a sound mind. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober or sound mind, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are <clears throat> passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Father, thank you today for these matchless passages of Scripture. <clears throat> what a blessing it is to not only read these verses, but to think about the depth of of these passages of Scripture as they speak to our hearts. I ask you now during these few moments to illuminate this Scripture to our being and help us to be drawn closer to you as a result of our exposure to this Word. And we'll thank you for it because we ask this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It is very obvious if you have been saved any length of time and you live according to biblical convictions, you have already manifested the fact that somebody has thrown off on your sincerity, your love, and your dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, secondly, it is obvious that if nobody has ever made fun of you, tried to put you down because of your commitment to Christ, then it's possible that you're not living as close to him 
as you possibly should. Because it's very obvious from the Bible, the Word of God, that the closer we get to Him, the more we love Him, the more opposition will be voiced against you. That's nothing new. That's been true ever since Jesus came and went back to heaven. If somebody hasn't called you a nutcase yet, then you probably are a little far off from divine fellowship with the Lord. But just remember, if somebody calls you a nutcase, you just tell them you might be a nut, but you're screwed on the right boat. That you, that you love and belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse number 13, that's what they said about the Apostle Paul. They called Paul a fool. In verse number 13, for whether we be beside ourselves. That's just a polite way of Paul saying whether they think I'm crazy or not. They looked at the Apostle Paul who gave up his previous lifestyle. They looked at the Apostle Paul who was held in high esteem by the Pharisees, the religious zealots, the nation of Israel, until he met the Savior. And he did a reversal. And they couldn't understand why the Apostle Paul is now preaching about the Christ that he once tried to destroy. And so they made fun of him. They said about the Apostle Paul that he had lost his mind, he was out of his tree, and he said, whether we be beside ourselves, it is of God. Now I'm sure if you've taken a stand on the scriptures where you work, somebody has probably said to you sooner or later, and I've had people to say this to me, you mean you still believe the Bible is the Word of God? You still believe everything that book says? I plead guilty. Yeah, I still believe the Bible is the Word of God. I believe every word of it is the Word of God. Not some of it, but all of it. Uh, you, still, you mean you still believe that Christians ought to be different than the world? Yeah, because that's what the Bible says. The Bible said we're not of the world. That we've been called out of the world and put back in the world to be ambassadors to the world. And people don't understand that. And they didn't understand the Apostle Paul. That's the reason he made the statement again in verse number 13. Whether we be beside ourselves, it's of God. I heard about a man who went into a psychiatrist's office. And he spoke to the nurse. And the nurse made her way back to the psychiatrist and said, we've got a problem. What's the problem? I said, we've got a man out in the waiting room who thinks he's invisible. Well, the doctor said to the nurse, go tell him, uh, go back there and tell him that uh, I can't see him. I can see some of you sitting around the dinner table after this service is over, and all of a sudden you start laughing like a hyena. And somebody's going to say to you, what are you laughing about? I just got what the preacher said. <laughs> now I want you to understand, if you're saved, you're strange to this world. But let me tell you why the world thinks you're strange. Here it is. Let me give you the bottom line. I could digress here for a long time, but let me tell you why the world believes you to be strange. It is because you are committed to a person. And the person is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the world simply does not understand that philosophy. Let me take it a step further. Not only does the world not understand it, but you, you come in contact with people who say they believe the same thing you do, but they won't understand you if you are committed to serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why they said what they did about Paul? You know why they treated him with disgust and disarray? You know why they thought he was crazy? Because his love was so intent 
for the Lord Jesus Christ, they really believed that he was off center and that he should not be so dedicated to a cause and he should not be so dedicated to a person. And so they couldn't understand that. So their comeback was to persecute him because of his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I want you to know something. It's not that I'm crazy, but it is the fact, look at it in verse number 14, it is the fact that the love of Christ constraineth me. He said, I am overmastered by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, the depth of my love and my commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ causes the people not to understand me. They don't understand my walk. He said, they don't understand my talk. They don't understand my lingo. They don't understand my actions. They don't understand my lifestyle because, he said, of my love and my commitment to the Lord Jesus because his love uh, compels me. The love of Jesus overmasters me. The love of Jesus, he says, uh, causes me to respond to him, listen, with every fiber of my being. He said the most important person in the world to me is the Lord Jesus Christ. He said he means more to me than anybody else in the world. He said my depth of commitment must be to the one who saved me by his grace and called me into the ministry. And when you're dedicated, when you're sold out to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, this world will look at you strange. Uh, and many who name and profess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will also look at you strange. Uh, but Paul said, they think I'm crazy. It's not that I'm crazy. It is the fact that I am sold out, lock, stock, and barrel to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. I like the songwriter who said, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Do you know what caused the Apostle Paul to be so dedicated, consecrated to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? Several things. But first of all, he could never get over the fact that he was such a great sinner and he had such a wonderful Savior. He couldn't understand that. He could never understand the depths to which Christ reached down to save him, forgive him, and lift him up. I read a story once about a lady who was uh, a very well-known, refined lady in London. And she came from a very wealthy family. She was wealthy, and then she married into a very wealthy family. And they had all that this world could offer them. They had uh, the clothing, they had the homes, they had the grounds, they had the bank accounts, they had the diamonds, they had the name brand clothes, uh, they, they, they moved in the society of the well-known people, the ups and the outers of London, and uh, just, just set for life. And the story said that one day she was walking down a street in London, had on this very expensive dress, very expensive shoes, very expensive gloves, uh, and she needed to pull a glove off or something, and she pulled a glove off of her hand, and when she did, there was this huge diamond ring worth tens of thousands of dollars unbeknown to her at the very split second when she pulled that glove off, that ring came off of her finger and bounced down on the pavement and bounced down into a cupboard. And she was so concerned. And the story said that she tried to get that one hand down in that slimy, filthy water. It was beyond way beyond the normal for her to do that. And she couldn't reach it. 
And she took the other glove off. And the story goes that she had an umbrella and she stuck the umbrella down there with the crook trying to get a hold of that ring and that slime and in all of that nastiness of everything that had settled, the corrosiveness that had settled in the bottom uh, uh, of that place. And, and she couldn't reach it. And said, finally, she positioned her dress in such a way that she got down on her knees and she took her delicate, pretty hand and put that delicate hand down in that slimy, filthy water. Why? Because there was a diamond down there and she had to reach down into that slimy, filthy water to reach, to reach that expensive diamond and to bring it up out of that filth. When I read that story, I thought, my soul, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Man, let me tell you something. The person that, high, that has the highest estimate of us is us. I don't know. My clothes and shoes, I don't know, they're used now. Maybe they're worth 20 bucks. If you took the elements out of my body, I don't know, inflation's now set in. It used to be worth less than a dollar. Even with inflation, the old body, the minerals and whatever that might come out of this body, it might be worth 20 bucks. I don't know. I don't know what it's worth. I know what some of you say. My body's worth more than that. I'm worth more than 20 bucks. Well, let me tell you something. In the sight of God, his creation is down in the dirty, filthy slime of this world. But he looked down from heaven's glory and he looked down into the dirty, filthy slime of this world and he could see a diamond. He could see the possibility of what the people stooped in sin could become. The Bible said that he went to the cross in the book of Hebrews for the joy, the joy that was set before him. You know what he looked at before he got to the cross? He looked beyond the cross. He looked to the day when this dirty, slimy, sinful, depraved human race could be brought up out of the slime pit of this world uh, and be redeemed and be justified and someday glorified and, and someday presented in his presence uh, without spot and without wrinkle. Uh, and he said the price is worth paying uh, to go down there and to bring them out and to make them diamonds uh, for my crown and for my glory for all of eternity. Uh, and Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. The love of Christ constraineth me that he would reach so low to take us so high. He said, it overmasters me. That word compel, that word constrain has a lot of meanings that tag to it and attach to it. But one of the mean, meanings of the word constrain, the love of Christ constraineth me, it compels me, was used of, and I was on the farm and I understand this, of taking the reins and pulling the horse in the right direction. As he, as he pulls the plow across the field, you take the reins and keep the horse uh, pointed in the right direction. Wow, I think about that, and I think about the love of Christ compelling me and constraining me, and it simply means that the love of Christ uh, pulls us, should pull us in the right direction. Uh, when this world comes to tempt us, the love of Christ ought to keep us moving in the right direction. Uh, and when people come to you and try to get you to compromise on your biblical convictions uh, and on your biblical Christianity, uh, your love for Jesus ought to be so much greater uh, that it compels you and keeps you focused 
focused uh, and keeps you moving in the right direction uh, and you realize uh, that there's nothing in this world uh, that's worth uh, what it means to serve and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ so you are compelled and you are constrained to follow him. And that's what he said, the love of Christ constraineth me. It takes charge of my life. It keeps me pointed in the right direction. Now notice what he said. I love this. Verse number 14, the love of Christ constraineth us. Now why does it do that? Look at what he said. Because we thus judge, we come to this conclusion, that if one died for how many people? Wow. Paul said, you want to know why the love of Christ overwhelms me? It's because Jesus died for me. Now, there's a crazy doctrine going around today that said he didn't die for everybody. There are some schools out there today, and I'm thinking of one right now in California. They teach in the classroom that Jesus Christ did not die for everybody. He just died for the elect. I'm thinking of a church right now in Winston-Salem, not far from where we are worshiping this morning, that never gives an invitation. They teach in the pulpit that certain people will never be saved. They teach in the pulpit that there are certain children that are birthed into this world that they will have no choice in the matter, that they are already elected and predestinated to go to hell, and if they could live a million years here on this earth and hear gospel sermon after gospel sermon after gospel sermon, they are elected to go to hell, and there's no hope for them. There's no way out. There's no heaven for them. It's only hell forever because they say in the economy of God, God has elected and predestinated a group of people to die and to go to hell. I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul said here. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all. Let me tell you something. I believe in the word election. It's in the Bible. I believe in the word predestination. It's in the Bible. But that is only part of the story. The whole story is he is not willing that any should perish. The whole story is people can be saved. It doesn't matter who they are, they can be saved. Now, we'll take just a moment. I want us to go to the rehearsal studio. I want us to go right back to some of the passages of Scripture that teach what I've just said. I want you to hear it. I want you to see it before I move on to the message today. And I'm going to ask you to turn back to a very familiar passage of Scripture, but we're going to go beyond that. In the uh, Gospel of John, chapter number 3, I want you to notice with me, please, what the Bible uh, reminds us of. Paul said that Christ died for all. Why is it that some people go to hell? He tells us here in this passage of Scripture. Why is it that there be people that will never be saved? He tells us here in this passage of Scripture. Notice with me in John chapter 3, and let's begin in verse number 14. Jesus is speaking, and he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now here's the story. They were out in the wilderness. They were dying. Uh, they'd been bitten by snakes uh, and uh, God told Moses to make a serpent uh, in the likeness of the snake, put it up on the pole and it would come to pass that whoever looked at that pole and uh, that snake would be made whole. That snake was in the, that, that they were to look at to bring healing was in the image of the snake that bit them. The Lord Jesus Christ came down here in the image of the human race. He took on a body like you have have and like I have, have, and he went up to Calvary's cross as a representative of you, for you and me and for the human race. Uh, and the Bible said that it came to pass, that it shall come to pass that whosoever looketh on him or believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what the next verse says. Look at it, please, in verse number 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, who is it that's to believe in him? Notice what the Bible said whosoever believeth. Now, wait a minute. Don't read over that. Why is it that people go to hell? 
It's not because they are predestinated. It's not because they are elected to go there. He tells you right here in verse 15 and following verses many times over. Why is it that people go to hell? They refuse to believe. Notice you, ha you have to believe. The Bible said that whosoever believeth in him, notice what it said, future tense, should not perish. You say, how do I know that I don't have to die and go to hell? You believe in Jesus. What does that mean? That's not just a mental ascent that you believe that he existed and that he lived 2,000 years ago. The word believe means to do exactly what everybody in this building is doing right now. You came in the building this morning. You believed on the chair you're sitting in. And you believed that that chair would hold you up or you would not have placed the weight of your body on that chair. To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ means I come to him and I place my never dying eternal soul into his care. I acknowledge to him I've sinned. I acknowledge to him that I've come short of his glory. I ask him to forgive me of my sins and I invite him to come into my heart, come into my life, forgive me and to save me. It goes this way. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, will sup with him and he with me. Uh, listen, he doesn't knock the door down to save you. Uh, listen to me. He doesn't force his way into your life. Uh, he stands at the door and he knocks. If you will open the door, he will come in. He will gladly come in. He will thankfully come in. He will graciously come in and he will fellowship with you, forgive you of your sins, save you by his grace, but he saves you as you believe by, listen, invitation only. If I come to your house this afternoon and I knock on your door and I know you're at home because I hear you and your wife fussing. <clears throat> I know you're home because you told the dog that was barking to be still. A man was on visitation one day and he went to the house and a little boy came to the door and the preacher said, Is your, are your parents at home? The little boy said, mama told me to tell you she's not here. Let me tell you something. Salvation is like going through a door. You knock on the, Holloman Hunt painted that beautiful picture many years ago and you may have a copy of it in your house. It shows Jesus standing at the door knocking. And he had a critic, after he had finalized the painting, he had a critic to look at that painting and say, do you see anything I've missed, anything I should do differently about the door? And the critic said to Holloman Hunt, yeah, you made a mistake. He said, what kind of mistake did I make? He said, you've got a door there, but you don't have a doorknob on the door. He said, that's not a mistake. He said, the doorknob is on the inside. He said, Jesus is standing out there knocking. But he said, in order for him to get in, he won't force his way in. He won't knock doors to get in. The, no the doorknob is on your side. And if when he knocks on the door of your heart, if you will open the door and you will invite him to come in, now, let me tell you, my friend, he's anxious to come in. He desires to come in. He wants to come in. He won't force his way in, however. If you want to die lost, he will allow you to do that. But it's not his will that you die lost. It is his will that you turn the knob by faith and say to King Jesus, come on in, forgive my sins. Come on in and become my Savior. Come on in and fellowship with me because he said in the book of the Revelation, that's what he desires to do. He fellowship with us. We fellowship with him. John chapter 10, the door, he goes in, we can go in and out and find rest and we can find peace and we can find fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ because he desires to fellowship with us. Now look at John 3.16. You've heard this all of your life. Most of you can quote it. Paul said he died for all of us. He said, I'm compelled, I'm constrained by the love of Christ. For God so loved the world. Wait a minute. Who did he love? Who did he love? The world. You say, I'm not sure he loves me. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you live in the world? 
If you don't, you need some help. If you don't know that you live in the world, listen, if you live in the world, you are a candidate for salvation. It takes four votes to get you to heaven. The Father has voted yes. The Son has voted yes. The Holy Spirit has voted yes. You cast the deciding vote. If you're willing to say, Lord, yes, come on in. I'm in the world. And I read here that your Father so loved the world that the world, not the world of plants, not the world of trees, not the world of animals, not the world of things, but the world of people. God so loved the world of people. Watch this. That he gave. My friend, in those three words, there's something deeper than we can ever understand. There's something there higher than we can ever scale and attempt to explain. That he gave means he looked down here, he saw a diamond in the rough, and he said, I'm willing to go down there and to raise them out of the field. I'm really willing to go down there and make that diamond all that it needs to be, ought to be, should be, can be. And he came, he came because God gave his only begotten son. Watch it, that whosoever believeth in him, watch this, should not perish in the future, but have everlasting life. My friend, there's enough gospel in that one verse of scripture to save the world. But look at the next verse. Let's not miss this. For God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world. Why? The world's already condemned. But that the world through him might be saved. Notice who he wants to save. The world, the world through him might be saved. Don't ever get the idea, I'm not sure he'd save me. If you're in the world, you're a candidate. If you're living and breathing and your heart's pumping blood and you've got enough intelligence to know that you've sinned, you've got enough intelligence to know the Bible said he took your place, then you've got enough intelligence to know the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But look at the next verse. Notice what the Bible says. For God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Now here it is. Here it is. There are those today who say, well, I just don't believe everybody can be saved. Well, notice what he said. Notice what he said. He that believeth, there's the key. How do you get saved? You've got to believe what God says about his son. Paul said that love constrains me. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now watch verse 19. Here's the great crisis of this hour. And this is the condemnation. That light, Jesus, is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Why is it that people don't want to get saved? They think the world has more to offer. They think the old lifestyle has more to offer. They think the devil has more to offer. Now, I don't know why in the world. Well, I guess I do. The devil's a great deceiver. You know, the first thing people think of when they think of the devil, they think of somebody with a red suit on, with a forked tail, with horns on top of his head, blowing smoke. Nobody's going to follow that unless you're a Duke Blue Devil. And even there, they paint them blue. <laughs> when people talk about, I don't know why people won't get excited about serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Those Blue Devils get excited. I won't get into it. Just rest. But why would anybody want to follow somebody like that? Somebody that's blowing smoke and suffer. Nobody's going to follow that. The devil won't come that way. The Bible said he's an angel of light. He comes disguised in a Christian uniform. He comes disguised in a long robe standing behind a liberal pulpit. 
He comes disguised uh, standing before Sunday school class. He comes disguised uh, carrying a Bible under his arm, having never been. He comes disguised uh, as a Christian, but in reality, uh, he hasn't believed. Listen, the key to getting to heaven is taking God at his word and believing, because if we fail to believe the report that he's given in the Bible, we have all of eternity to regret it. Now let's come back to our text for just a moment in 2 Corinthians. I want you to see this. I'm just trying to get out of the introduction right quick. I want you to notice what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He said, the love of Christ constraineth me. Because we, we thus judge, we come to the conclusion that if one died for all. Now over and over in this chapter, he reminds us that he died for all of us. Look with me, if you will, please, in verse 15, twice he says it. And that, look at this, he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which, look at this, died for them. Look at verse number 21, for he hath made him to be sin, look at the next two words, for us, for us. What did Jesus do? He literally had the penalty of sin placed on him. He, went, he literally went to hell for us. He went, literally took our place. He literally suffered for us. God has taken a substitute on our behalf, and that substitute is his son, and he has charged every sin we've ever committed to his account. And when we believe, he takes his righteousness and charges it to our account. And when the Father sees us, he sees us clothed in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. That's the reason Paul said, the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look at the next part of that verse. Then where, look at it. Notice what the Bible said. Then were all dead. Everybody needs to be saved because everybody is dead in trespasses and sin. You go over to the funeral home. I'm trying to be detrimental, but you just go over here in Winston Salem this afternoon. There's the body. They put the colored lights on it. They they put the makeup on. They put the clothes on. Everything. That body. It looks like a body. It is a body. But the most vital part of that body is missing. Life. It's dead. There's multitudes of people across the countryside today. They look like Christians. They can pass the smell test. They can pass a Bible quiz. They own a Bible. They watch some religious television shows. They listen to some religious broadcasting. They occasionally sit in the church. They occasionally even do certain menial tasks or major tasks in the church, they have got at least the resemblance of life. But when the king of the universe looks down in their soul, they're dead, having never been saved. Paul said it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sin. Hear me well. I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. Right here is the reason why multitudes in America today talk about Jesus Christ, but when the rubber meets the road, they're not to be found. You know why? They have semblances of religion. They have resemblances of religion. Paul said they even have a knowledge of God, but deny the power thereof. I can name a person right now, and uh, nobody in here would know who I'm talking about, but I can name a person that I knew years ago. He was always clean. I mean, speak and span, wore the finest suit to church. He never missed a service. He was more faithful than the members of the church. Uh, he wore the nice shoes. He kept his shoes shined. Uh, his haircut was, was uh, pristine. Uh, he looked like a Christian. If you've ever looked at a person, 
and, and come to the conclusion that that person there must be a Christian, you would have said that about that person. He was there on Sunday morning for Sunday school. He was there for 11 o'clock. He was there for Sunday night, Wednesday night. When the church had revival, you could count on him. I can see him right now. I know exactly where he sat. Uh, he sat there with his Bible. When the preacher said, open your Bible to a certain verse of Scripture, he knew right where to go. He had been going to that church for 40 years uh, and uh, was more faithful uh, uh, in the church and some of the people that were members of the church. Uh, but when you go by and talk to him about his soul, uh, he would clam up. He would invite you into his house. Uh, uh, he would talk to you about the weather. He would talk to you about politics. He would talk to you about any subject you want to talk about and when you would weave the conversation around and you'd say to him, let me ask you a question uh, and I'll call his name Jack. That wasn't his name, but I, I said to him several times and other preachers did the same thing. I said, Jack, I want to ask you a question. I appreciate your faithfulness to church. I appreciate you come with a Bible under your arm. Uh, you're always there, but Jack, I want to ask you a question. Uh, if you died today, do you know 100% for sure that you'd go to heaven and he'd clam up? You couldn't get one word out of him. I'd come back and revisit it again, and I'd say, Jack, I want to ask you a question. If something happened to you today and you died, I said, I hope you live to be 100, but if something happened to you today, do you know 100% for sure that you'd go to heaven? He would not answer me a word. Other preachers went by. They experienced the same type of, uh, of uh, invitation into his house and etc. And I don't know how many times. I remember one time God burdened me for him. I went to his house uh, and about halfway through trying to talk to him about his never dying soul. He was so clean and, and looked so much like a Christian and, and seemed to be externally Christ-like. Uh, I remember halfway through the conversation, God broke my heart. I started weeping in his presence and I said, Jack, please, I want to know, hey man, I want to spend eternity with you. I want to know for sure that you know you're saved. I've got a burden for you. God sent me over here today. I want to make sure that you're saved. Let me ask you, if you died today, you know 100% for sure you'd go to heaven. And he looked at me and never answered me. I got down on my knees right in front of him. I put my hand on his knee with tears running down the side of my face. I said, Jack, God sent me over here today. I'm burdened for you. I want to know for sure that that you're saved to please. Let's talk about it. You'll talk about everything else. He would not answer me. He would not answer me. And I don't know to this day if that man ever got saved or not. He would not answer me. My friend, listen. The Bible is very clear here in this passage of Scripture. If one died for all, then all were dead. There's multitudes of people today they can talk the lingo. I'll guarantee you 90% of the people you come in contact with this week, if you raise this question, if you say this to them, if you die today, do you know you'd go to heaven? Do you know what the answer is? Many of them would say, sure. And we drop the ball many times. We say, wonderful. We have to come back. And we have to say, wait a minute. What basis of assurance do you have that you're going to heaven? And then they'll come back and they'll say something like this. Well, I believe in God. And then we have to say, wait a minute. The Bible said the devil believes in God. I'll say, what other assurance do you have you're going to heaven? Well, I'm a good person. We don't go to heaven by being good. The Bible says we're, there's none good, no, not one. Somebody said, and I hear this, so, well, I believe in Jesus, and I'm trying to live a good life. I've raised a good family. You don't go to heaven because you live a good life. It's wonderful that you raise a good family. You don't go to heaven because you raise a good family. You don't go to heaven because you can carry a Bible under your arm. You don't go to heaven because you sit on a chair in a church. You don't go to heaven because you hold an office in a church. You don't go to heaven because when somebody asks you, what assurance do you have that you know you're going to heaven? Uh, well, I just believe I made this decision a long time ago. And they know down in their heart of hearts that their life has never changed. And yet they're willing to base all of eternity on some kind of decision way back yonder somewhere that never transformed their lives. Look at verse 17. That's what the Bible said. Therefore, if any man, wait a minute, he died for the whole world. And if those who are saved, if any man be in Christ, 
He's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When we believe right biblically, then our lives are transformed. We become a new creation. All things pass away and all things become new. If we're saved, we're changed, we're transformed. One of the great tragedies, one of the great tragedies in verse number 10 of this chapter. Look at it. Is that the Christians are going to have to appear at the judgment seat of Christ. Notice he said we. He's talking to the Christians. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he have done, whether it be good or bad. The word bad there means worthless. Paul said, the love of Christ constraineth me. Why does it constrain me? I'm going to have to face him someday. My dear pastor who's in heaven, he wrote me a letter one day and he said, Ron, when you pray, call my name before the throne of grace because I'm known there. Coming up out of Concord, North Carolina, I went, drove to Concord to pick him up to take him to Baptist Hospital to have radiation treatment. Died with cancer. I can hear it. It rings in my ears right now as much as it rang in my ears when he made the statement. He looked at me and he said, Ron. He said, the one thing that's kept me motivated. He said, I've been misunderstood, misaligned, cursed, and disgusted. But he said, the one thing that's kept me active, the one thing that's kept me going forward and pastoring in spite of all the negativity, in spite of all the hardships, in spite of everything I've gone through, he said, the one thing that's kept me focused is that one day I know, understand, and realize I've got to stand in the presence of God. And I want you to hear me today. If nothing else motivates you to be constrained by the love of Christ, that one statement ought to compel you above every other thing to realize that someday, someday, somewhere, someplace, a doctor or a nurse is going to put a stethoscope on your chest and on my chest if Jesus tears, it's coming and they're going to look up on the wall to the clock to see what time is going to be put on your death certificate. My friend, when we get to that point, the only thing that's going to matter is whether or not we have truly biblically believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then whether or not we have made an investment in our life for the cause of Jesus Christ. Listen, we don't need to waste our lives. We need to invest our lives. We need to be brought face to face, front to front once again with reality. That everybody here, including this preacher, has an appointment to stand in the presence of an omnipotent God that ought to send tremors in the gable ends of our soul if we're not living for him the way we should. Paul said three things in this verse, verse 14. He said, the love of Christ constraineth me, it overmasters me. Secondly, because he died for me. And thirdly, because when he found me, I was dead in trespasses, and in sin. If God's dug you out of the slime pit of this world, you ought to be saying, thank you, God, hallelujah, that you would love me enough to come after me. You ought to be saying, thank you, God, for giving me an opportunity to serve you and to love you. This and we're finished. Here's a truth I've never dug the depths of. In the book of Peter, it says that the angels desire to look into the salvation. Like angels looking over the cherubim in the holy place in the temple in the tabernacle, the angels were there, and they had these angels looking over the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. Their penetrating eyes look over it. Peter said that the angels look into the church, that's us. They look into those of us who are heirs of salvation with a penetrating gaze. They're watching us. Angels, other created beings of God, they look at the church. Why are they looking at us? Because it is unknown to the angels why God stepped aside beyond them and went around them to come down to fallen humanity. 
Angels were old, are older than the human race. Angels were created by God. When God, they were present at the creation of the universe. Job 38 said that the angels praised God when he created the world. Angels fell. Many of them are chained in everlasting darkness. God never offered them a Savior. They're higher beings than we are. God never offered them a Savior. They worked for him for no telling how many billions of years before the human race ever showed up. God never offered them a Savior. When the human race sinned back there in the Garden of Eden where we had our beginning and where we came from, God had already preordained before all of eternity that a Savior would come down here and die for everybody on this earth and give everybody on this earth an opportunity to go to heaven. I don't understand it. But I'm going to tell you one thing. I praise God for it. I don't know why he would love us the way he loved us. But Paul said he died for all because all were dead. Thank God for Jesus. We're to tell other people about him. That's our job. I hope we'll learn to do so. Let's stand with our heads bowed, with our eyes closed. First of all, if you're listening to me today in this building or outside of this building, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I've tried to make it as clear and plain as I know how that you can be saved and be saved today. There's no doubt about it. It's clear in the Bible. He died for the world. He died for you. But secondly, it's clear also in the Bible that if you're saved today, he has brought you out, brought you out of the cesspool of iniquity. And moved your destination from hell to heaven. And you know what that means? That means we owe him our best. If somebody would love us like Jesus loved us, the least we can do is to live for him and to serve him. We're going to sing a stanza in just a moment. But while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want to raise the question today. The Holy Spirit might have spoke to someone in this building today to help you understand. You might be religious, but you've never been saved. And the Holy Spirit of God's been speaking to you. Maybe even before you came in this building, there might have been some questions in your mind and in your heart about whether or not you're really saved. And you say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I think I am, but man, I'm, this, we're talking about eternity. I want to know for sure I'm saved. Please pray for me. Slip your hand up high and let me pray for you. I see the hands. I see the hands. Anyone else, just before I pray, I think I may be, but I also think I may not be. Yes. Yes, I see your hand. Secondly, I'll raise this question. I realize he did so much for me when he brought me out of the cesspool of this world and saved me by his grace. And I want to be honest, I owe him more than I'm giving him today. He's worth more than the allegiance that I'm giving him. He's so precious that he would take me into his consideration and forgive me. But I owe him more than I'm giving him. And I know I'm saved, but I know I owe him more than I'm giving him. I want you to pray for me that I may, I may have the crisis in my life where not only he'll be my Savior, but he'll be my Lord. That I'll give him more of my time. I'll give him more of my talent because he's done so much for me. Pray for me, preacher. I see hands all over the building today. Dear Jesus. I promise to pray for these folks, and I do. I pray first of all for the several hands that went up today that said, when I think about it, there's a good possibility I may not be saved. And oh, dear Jesus, what a tragedy it would be after a salvational sermon is preached. And someone would say no once again. What a tragedy it might be 
Could be this would be that person's last service. You had me to stand between them and in a Christless eternity once again and remind them that they could get it settled today. Help this become the day when they get it settled. I pray for all of the Christians today who acknowledged I could give him more. I could do more. Lord, don't let us waste what's left. Don't let us throw away what's left. Help us to invest it, and invest it wisely in eternity. And we'll love you and thank you for it. Because we ask in Jesus' name. The quartet's going to sing in just a moment, but I want to say, first of all, if you raised your hand and you said, I'm not sure I'm safe, I want you to slip out. I want you to make your way right here. If you need help, somebody coming where you are, we'll be glad to do that also. But I want you to know you're saved. I want you to come. Secondly, if you're saved but you say, I need to give more to him, I want you to step out. Let this be the crisis day. If you don't get started, you'll never get started. If you don't decide, you may never decide. You do today what the Spirit of God's calling you to do. Follow him now while you can. Tomorrow you may not be able to. Next week you may not be able to. You can now. Give him what he deserves. He caught you when you was dead. He revived you, took you out of the graveyard of sin. He's available today. He's right now available. Quartet's singing. If others need to come, would you come right now while they sing? Christian martyr said years ago just before the fire was built and he became a human sacrifice for the cause of Christ he made this statement I only regret that I have but one life to give to Christ only one only a few short years and then it's over they sing the last stanza. If others need to come today, I want you to come. Give it to him. He's worthy as they sing. Oh, stand. 